Isn't it a good day? Yeah, yeah Chiefs are going to win. Yeah. <laughs> I almost got you sucked in on that. <laughs> <laughs> so just so you know, I lived in Kansas City almost 20 years, so I am a bit of a Chiefs fan. Second to the Seahawks, but I'm a bit of a Chiefs fan, so. But God's will be done, amen? All right. <laughs> so uh, a couple of things uh, before we get started. Um, just to remind you again about elections or next Sunday. Uh, if you are a member, if you formally join the church, uh, you can vote and it'll be over in the library over here. Uh, the other thing um, is that this is going to be the last of this series. And so next Sunday, we're kicking off a new teaching series we're calling Ask. And if you remember last year, I did a series that kind of grappled with hard questions, right? Uh, I don't think we want to turn away from those and pretend those don't matter. And so we're going to uh, do a number of, of what I think of as hard questions for Christians. Uh, I asked you last year to send in your questions. You can still do that. Uh, the sermon series is set, however, uh, what we're going to talk about. And some of the ones that, that don't make it into the, the preaching, uh, I probably will do some stuff on YouTube where I'll kind of try and tackle some of those as well. But here's, here's the questions we're going to uh, deal with in the next five weeks after this Sunday. Number one, is God real? We're going to kind of talk about uh, how, we, how we interact with that. What about hell? We'll talk about that. And is heaven real? And why doesn't God answer my prayers? Okay. Why do innocents suffer? And so those will be the ones we'll kind of grapple with, and, and then we'll have some others that uh, are on, on YouTube that we'll deal with. You guys send in a ton of questions. Some of them really be hard to do a sermon around them. Uh, so uh, I hope you'll come and be a part of this. This is a great time to bring your friends if they have questions uh, as well about faith in Christ. So um, <clears throat> we have uh, this, we've been leaky faith, and it, this is kind of about what I think of as epiphany, about telling the world, spreading the good news. <laughs> Telling the world, spreading the good news. Okay, good. Yeah, because you're all on board with that. So let's, um, let's look at our uh, uh, memory verse and say it together one more time. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And so um, just kind of to review and get us all on the same page uh, with this, we kind of started out talking about uh, the idea that um, it, it should be sweet, okay? And we kind of set up uh, the, the whole series with, with this kind of purpose statement. Do life in such a way that people are attracted to the Jesus they see in you, right? Um, the old kind of form of evangelism was kind of a, calling people a sinner and, and just kind of really coming after them in, in what I would think of as kind of a hard close and a hard approach uh, to that. Uh, I, I'll be honest, I've been a follower of Jesus all of my life, and that doesn't even appeal to me, okay? Um, but instead, the way we, I think, is a much better way is that if we will be Jesus to the world, Jesus is attractive, okay? We're not attractive, but Jesus is attractive. And if we live that out, if we live in such a way that they can see Jesus in us, that is attractive to the kingdom of God. Amen? Okay, so we kind of reviewed quickly. The first Sunday was uh, what leaks out of us should be sweet and make people want more. And we kind of talked about sweet biscuits and honey. And it was one of those illustrations by the end I'd lost you all because you were all thinking about sweet biscuits and honey. And so they warn us about that. Um, and then the second week we talked about spiritual fruit that we should leak uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Just like if you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice out of it. If you squeeze an apple, you get apple juice out of it. When you squeeze squeeze a Christian, you should get the spiritual, uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit that comes out. And I'll tell you, <laughs> it bothers me that when we talk about these characteristics, this is not what people think Christians are like, right? This should be what they go. Those Christians, they may, I don't know about, well, they believe in all that stuff. Man, let me tell you, they are full of love and joy and peace and patience. When you rub up against them, this is what happens, okay? Week uh, three uh, is, is hope is a profound confidence that our God will one day provide light despite the utter blackness of the moment. So we talked about hope, that, that when we're interacting with people who are far from God, we should give them the hope we have in Christ Jesus. Amen? 
I mean, that's super attractive. We live in a world that just doesn't have a lot of hope, okay? Uh, and so uh, today, what we want to talk about is leak grace. Say grace. Okay? Uh, and this is such an important thing uh, because it, grace forms two functions in this idea of being leaky. Um, grace is about what you leak and how you leak. Say how you leak. Right. So how you do something is just as important as what you do in, in many ways in life. Amen. I mean, there's just all kinds of things where it, it matters how, how you do it. So um, if I, I, I love mentors in my life, uh, but I've learned to be a little careful about who they are. So uh, imagine if someone comes to me and says, uh, hey, Craig, we need to talk about whatever. Uh, I think there's some things I can teach you that will help you uh, with, with what you're trying to do. Uh, and and, and that, that makes me want to go, oh, what, do you, what, what can I learn? How can I get from this person? Right? I'm, I'm interested. I'm, I engage. As opposed to somebody who approaches me with, hey, stupid, pull your act together, shut up and listen to me, and I'll show you how to do it. Anyone detect the difference between those two? <laughs> and it might be that that second person actually has some really good stuff to teach me, but it kind of shuts me down when you start like that. And I've, I've had people like that in, in my life. And so when we talk about grace, it's not just that we should leak grace. We should leak grace. But grace is also a huge part about how we leak in our world, how we reach out. It, it's so important. Uh, we're going to look at Ephesians in a little bit, but later on in Ephesians, we get this, this phrase that has just really formed me personally. In Ephesians 4, it says, speaking the truth in love, yeah. So it doesn't change the truth, but it does change how you speak it, when you speak it in love rather than in arrogance or rather than in judgment or all of those other ways we can speak it. We speak the truth in, in love. Uh, and, and in John, uh, Jesus is called, I uh, said, so Jesus was filled with truth and grace. Truth and grace right? The way he talked about it, the way he communicated, the way he spoke truth to people, and Jesus spoke truth, okay? But he did grace. And we live in a time where I hear people talk like, if you do it in a loving way or a gracious way, you're not really speaking truth to people. They kind of have this idea that you can speak truth. If you're right, you can do it any way you want. And that is not what the Bible teaches. Amen? Okay? So, um, it, let's, let's look at the text this morning. Uh, go to, oops, let me jump over. Ephesians 2, 4 through 9. If you have your Bibles, you can flip over there, or your phones, or whatever you want, and I'll put it up here uh, as well. Um, and so I, I, I find this particular passage to be uh, wonderful and challenging, like a, a lot of Scripture is. So beginning at verse 4, it says this, but because of his great love for us, okay, so he set it up. This is why all of this stuff that follows, because of this, because of his love for us. So this whole thing is grounded in the love of God. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. By, it is by grace you have been saved. So there's some really in, important stuff in there. Uh, so rich is, is a word that, that we all like. So anybody got an idea is how much money you have to have to be rich? <laughs> how much? Uh, anywhere between 100,000 and a million. 100,000 and a million. Okay, that's a good start. I, I heard a really rich guy say one time, just a little more. <laughs> you know? and, and so, What? One more dollar, yeah, just, just a, a, little, a little bit more. I have a friend um, who is rich. Uh, he built a company and the whole thing. Uh, and he said it like this. He said, you know you are rich when you can buy anything you want and it won't change your lifestyle, right? You can, it, it, it's not gonna, so like most of us, you know, especially um, when we were young, you know, and we bought cars on credit. When we bought a car, it was like, okay, we're gonna have to scrimp now for a while, and we're gonna, it changed kind of our lifestyle, right? Okay, it's gonna be bologna sandwiches instead of, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and so they kind of talked about, it. so basically, in one sense, the idea of rich is this more money than you know what to do with, right? More money than you can, you can possibly spend on anything. And so I love that God is rich in mercy. God has more mercy than he could possibly use on all of us, and I'm taking up a big portion of it, okay? So, I mean, there's, there's this idea of rich in this thing called, called mercy, okay? Um, uh, and then, uh, Christian sins, uh, it is by grace you have 
been saved. And, and the word saved there is kind of, um, we sometimes think of this kind of transactionally, like, you know, okay, I got saved, so now I'm good. You know, it's like buying your house. Okay, I got the house, that's it. But, but the word saved there actually kind of carries the idea of what I would call savedness. You, you have been saved and you are being saved, right? It's an ongoing process of what God is doing in our life. It's like being alive. You have been alive and you are still alive. Amen? If you have any doubts, poke your neighbor, make sure, you know, if they move, then they're alive, okay? You, you, you are alive in all of this. So then he goes on, verse 6, and God raised us up uh, with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms of Christ Jesus. Um, in order that, so here's the purpose for that, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incompatible riches of his grace. So he's back to this riches sort of thing, right? So you, more, more grace, more mercy than you can ever show, and now more riches than you can ever show. Express kindness, that come out, it comes out in kindness to us in Christ Jesus, okay? So, uh, I- incomparable, incomparable riches. And, and uh, this almost feels like when, when the author's writing, he, he wrote the first one, you know, riches in mercy. And then he decided that just riches wasn't strong enough. So he added this thing of, of incomparable. Uh, and, and in the Greek, it actually carries the idea of immeasurable. How would you like to have so much money you couldn't count it? You know? Oh, come on. <laughs> Plus, you could give more to the church, you know, the kingdom of God. Uh, so, oh, did I say that? There's a little preacher coming out and all that. So. So, so the idea now here is that there's just so much grace and so much mercy in, in, in God that you, you just can't, you can't count it. You can't understand how much there is. It's way more than you could possibly uh, uh, imagine. And so and that finds its expression in kindness. Say kindness. Kindness. I, I just want to remind you, kindness isn't just something we do. It's actually one of the fruits of the Spirit. Amen? It's one of the things that should come out in us. And, and so kindness is a big deal. So let's look um, three words that describe how we are supposed to leak. The first one is mercy. Okay? And when I think of mercy, I think of this. It's not getting what you deserve. Right? So imagine one of you went out and you decided to steal a car. And you get caught, you know, and you're in front of the judge, and you know you are guilty, and everybody knows you are guilty. They got all the evidence. Your lawyer's saying to you, you're going away, dude, you know. And the judge listens to the whole thing and all of that, and he says, you know what? I'm going to give you a little mercy, and I'm just going to let you go and drop all the charges. What do you do? Well, you dance better than me probably, but, but you know, if you get out of that, that's mercy. You're not getting what you deserve. You knew you deserved. You, you stole the car, right? So, so mercy, God is rich in, in mercy, and mercy is the way we are to leak. We are to leak mercy to people, okay? And then the second word, of course, was grace, getting what you don't deserve. So now imagine, finally, you're getting out of the courthouse. You're like, oh man, this is great, you know, and you're, you're headed down towards, you know, uh, wherever you're going, and, and all of a sudden, you see the judge standing there, you know, and he's in the parking lot, and, and he's standing next to a car, and he says, you know, I know that you, uh, you don't have a car, you don't have anything, uh, in order to have a job, all those things, you, you need a car, so I'm going to give you my car. That's grace. You get something you don't deserve, right? So you get off, and then you get grace, you get mercy, you don't get what you deserve, and you, and you get the, something then that you uh, don't deserve that, that's good. And then all of that is wrapped up in kindness, what mercy and grace look like to the world. When you treat people with mercy and grace, they are going to think you're kind. They say, well, that's what it feels like to them. So say, mercy, grace, kindness. Yes. So, mercy, grace, and kindness are heart issues. They're heart issues. It's not something you can do by gritting your teeth. I mean, you can, but you won't do it very long. You know, if it's like, oh, give this person mercy, you know. Oh, the Lord made me give that to them. I'm going to have to help them out, you know. It won't be very long before you be not listening to the Lord at all. Because in order for these things to flow out of you, there has to be something that happens uh, in our hearts the matter is, we can always justify not being merciful, right? Well, this person doesn't deserve it. Well, this is the fourth time they've done that, you know, kind of forgetting Jesus' whole thing about forgiving seven times 70, which means like always, you know, it's not a matter of adding up the numbers and getting the math. 
We can, we can always find reasons for that. Or, or we can always argue why we shouldn't extend grace to someone. It's easy to do that. Or, or we can say, well, kindness doesn't have anything to do with it. I'm right, you know? Uh, and, and so that we can always step away from this and we only really get where God wants us to be when he changes our heart. You see, I believe your creator cares about, more about who you are than what you know. Understand that difference? He cares more about who you are than, than what you know. He, he wants to mold you into the image of, of Christ. And, and I, I, that truth has been important to me because I like theology. I like truth, and I think I'm right, <laughs> you know? And I think some of those other people are wrong in all of that. And it's really easy to get into the, we're right, and they're wrong, and therefore we're going to blast them. And then there's this passage in Scripture that comes from Jesus when asked, what's the bottom line with this? It's love God with your whole heart, love the people around you like family, build all your religion on this. And I want to go, what about truth? And he goes, you weren't listening. Love God with your whole heart, love the people around you like family, build all your religion on this. And the sad truth is, the implication is that love is more important than truth. You know, and that, that's difficult. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I have given over a great deal of my life and treasure to understanding truth in the Bible, and that's a part of what it's all about. But when we get to heaven, there will not be a theology test. It'll be about relationship with Christ. And so, so we need our, our, our heart changed in, in all, all of this, okay? Um, and so and it goes on, verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved, okay? You've got something you didn't deserve, Amen? Okay, that's good news. This is not of yourselves, as if you didn't get the point as to what grace was, but a gift of God to you. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Say, no one can boast. <laughs> We're going to get to that later, but I wanted to make sure you got that. Um, but here, here's the deal. God graciously gives you salvation that you do not deserve. Graciously extends this to you. And I'm always curious about this. This is one of those things that always makes me you know, kind of tilt my head, you know. You ever dog when they're kind of listening and they kind of tilt their head? I, I do that sometimes. I kind of tilt my head. And one of the ways times I tilt my head is when I hear followers of Jesus who are constantly upset that someone is getting something they don't deserve. I want to go, what? You know, what? well, they, they didn't deserve that. I want to go, have you compared yourself to Christ lately? You know, we, our very salvation, the thing that matters most to us was given to us because even though we don't deserve it. And do you know how much grace God has poured into your life? Do you? <laughs> it's more than you think. He's constantly pouring it into us. And, and you know, when I think about this, I, I think about something, you know, when I was a teenager. You guys probably were smarter than me, but one of the things I used to say to my dad fairly often is, life isn't fair. Anyone else say that to their parents? Your kids say that to you at some point, you know, and, and all, of, all of that. And, and uh, my dad would say, you're right, it's not fair. Now go do what I told you to do, kind of a thing, you know. You see, when people talk about fair, and I noticed this when I was growing up, I was almost always complaining that someone got ahead of me and an advantage on me. When I got an advantage, I didn't think it was so bad, you know? It's kind of like, hey, that, that's cool. Um, and so here's what I think is true with this idea of grace and salvation and all the grace that God pours into our lives in so many ways. Um, life isn't fair, and we should thank, all thank God, amen? Because if life was fair, we'd all spend an eternity away from God. If life was fair, our lives would be awful because God keeps pouring good things into us, mercy and grace, and, and we are to pour that into one another. You did not save yourself. God saved you. That's so important. And that is a way of looking at the world. That's not just an isolated truth. It is an understanding that reminds us. That's why we come to the communion table, reminds you that God did this for you. And it's a way of thinking about and remembering what God has done for us in all of those sorts, all the things that go on in, in our life. So, all the good we have in our lives is a gift from the hand of our Creator. All of the good we have in our lives. When I, I was a teenager, I should have had this as a poster on my my wall somewhere. I had different posters on my wall, but this is the one I should have had on it. 
Because I, I used to think, you know, because I was smart, I was accomplishing things, you know, and I was working hard and I was doing all those things you're supposed to do. And it was a long time before the Lord reminded me that all of the things I used were gifts from God. So when I put this kind of stuff up here, sometimes people go, you know, I work hard. I'm smart. I'm clever. And I want to say to them, you are clever because God made you clever. Amen? You are intelligent because God gave you that gift. You, you, if you have aptitude that, that, that makes you earn a living and all of those sorts of things, God gave you the aptitude. If you work hard, guess who gave you the energy? God, okay? It, it, you know, it, opportunities that have come into your life is because God has been giving you those opportunities. He's been working those sorts of things. And if you don't think that's true, what do you think your life would look like if you were grow, born in, say, Mongolia? You wouldn't be quite as smart as you think you are. You might not have very much education. You wouldn't have the wealth that you have. All just because God allowed you to be born in a place where you were filled with opportunities. I'm telling you, all the good we have in our lives is a gift from the hand of our Creator to us. And therefore, we have some responsibilities that come with that. I, I, I should, I know, moment illustration about my son, but I, hopefully he'll forgive me. Most of you know my son was gifted and, and all of that sort of thing. So I was constantly saying to him, to whom much is given, much is required. To whom much is given, much is required. And God has given us much, amen? I mean, even, you know, your relationships and your spouse and your kids and all of those uh, sorts uh, of things. So, because God was his merciful, gracious, and kind to us when we were still sinners... He expects us to treat people the same way. To treat people like we have been treated by him. God is our example. You want to know how to treat people? Look at Jesus. That's who we look at in all of this. He's the one that has given it uh, to us. Uh, we have experienced the mercy, spared the consequences. You know, frankly, some of you'd be in jail. Don't say amen because you'll give yourself away. Okay? <laughs> I did pause to see if somebody kind of, you know, you know, no. the grace that is given to us in, in all kinds of ways that, that, that people have lived this out for me. I mean, around here we talk about sideways grace, you know. God, God pours grace into us, but, but most often when we receive grace, it's because it's poured it into one of you and you give it to someone else. I am the product of grace. I would not be here were it not for the grace of a professor when I was in seminary. When I was in seminary, it was hard. I was working full time. I had a kid, you know. Um, I was trying to go to school as much as I possibly could. And a couple, three years into it, I just hit the end. I was just done. I was emotionally exhausted. I was physically exhausted. I was living in Kansas City, and I couldn't hardly even be at the seminary, so I didn't really have very many friends uh, in, in all of that. And, and we had run out of money. It was just, it wasn't going to happen. I wasn't going to be able to go to school anymore. And word got around, so I kind of said to my few friends that I, I was done, and I was ready to come back to the Northwest and get my really good job that paid really well, you know. And, and you always justify stuff like that. Lord, if I could go back and get that job, I could give more money to the church, you know. <laughs> Turns out he was not impressed. <laughs> but he got back around to a professor of mine who had, I kind of liked the philosophical world, and he had had a really successful career in philosophy, and then he came to the seminary, uh, when he retired and kind of taught us, and I had really enjoyed his classes, and somehow he got word of it. I'm not sure how it was, and one day in our little bitty apartment in Kansas City, there was a knock on the door, and my wife opened the door, and there he was, and I had been back in the back room, and I, to give you an idea as to where I was emotionally, when I heard his voice, I just stayed in, my, in the bedroom because I, I didn't want to come out and see him. I didn't want to deal with it, any of that sort of thing, and so he asked. He said, why is, why is Craig not coming back to seminary, you know? And Jody kind of tried to explain, but she said, you know, one of the really big things is even if he wanted to, we don't have, we don't have the money. And his response was to say, if he will come back, I will pay for the next semester of seminary. That's not cheap. That's not cheap. And um, the Lord knew how my brain worked. And I felt like it was boxed in. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'll go back to seminary. And by the time the next semester rolled around, things were going better, and I finally got through all of that. And today I'm in the ministry. But had God not intervened with grace in that moment, 
I would probably be a successful lawyer and divorced because that brings out the worst in me. <laughs> I am telling you, we, we are products of this, and, and when this is lived out, it, it's sweet. It, it's so sweet. It, I found out when I went to his funeral that he had done that kind of thing for all kinds of people. He had just pushed grace into their lives in wonderful sorts uh, of ways. And so I, I just, we just got to get this right somehow. I think we live in a time where a lot of people use truth as a weapon. You know, they beat up on people because I'm right and, and you're wrong, and they completely miss the idea of, of the way that we are supposed to do this with mercy, with grace, with kindness. Say hey, mercy, grace, kindness. Yeah. In fact, I think that's why that last line, that no one may boast. You know what boasting is? It's pride. You know, I'm better than you. I'm smarter than you. I got a better grade than you. I, you know, that sort of thing. And, and he just wants to get rid of all of that, okay? And, 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 and just be genuine and loving and careful. We aren't better than anybody. <laughs> we aren't better than anybody. Keep in mind, you're all going to stand before your creator one day, right? You know? Hey, and so that's why boasting is so destructive because it begins to make it okay to, to not be merciful or to, to not be gracious or to, to not be kind uh, in, in this world. And, and it drives us all crazy. I, I know that. You, any of you ever had to work with someone who, like, stole people's ideas and then took credit and boasted about it? Yeah, boy, that's an icky feeling, isn't it? There's, there's a, a, a story in the Bible that I, I, I really love. Um, it's, it's a story about the, the woman caught in adultery. Um, and if you read through that story, it, it's kind of an interesting sort of thing. Jesus comes back into Jerusalem, and it says a large crowd gathered, so there's a whole bunch of people there. And right in the middle of that, the, the religious leaders uh, drag a, a woman in through all that crowd, and, and it doesn't say so, but I imagine that probably threw her down in, in front of him. Uh, and, and then they challenged him, him and said, listen, uh, we caught this woman literally in the act of adultery. Now, they don't ever bring the guy, okay? So you kind of wonder about all this. And, and, and they say, the law says to stone her, you know, what, what, what do you say to all of this? And the interesting part that I had missed for years and years and years is Jesus said, okay, stone her. He did. He said, just one, one little condition and that is, whoever's going to throw the first stone has to be without sin. Well, that kind of cut down on the available candidates, right? There's only one, and that was Jesus, and he chose not to throw the first stone. And then it records that he, he, um, he starts writing in, in, in the dust, and we don't, we don't know what he wrote. But commentators say, say sometimes, you know, maybe he started writing their sins, right? And one of them I read speculated that uh, potentially he, um, you know, one of the men that were with him were the people that, that was involved in the affair. And so maybe the first one he wrote was adulterer, right? And they thought they were talking about her, but the guy that was involved is like, ooh, that's me. Or, or maybe he wrote thief and blasphemer, or murderer, or liar. And, and one by one, they began to, began to pull away until at the end they were gone. And Jesus, of course, said to her, where are those who condemn you, you know? And she said, they're gone. And, and he said, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Mercy, grace, kindness. If there's anybody she's going to listen to, go and sin no more, it would have been Jesus, right? Because of the way he approached her, because of the way he, he loved her. And you and I, we are the product of grace and kindness and, and mercy, so here's what I want to say, all of this kind of piece of it. How we leak matters. If we leak stones, the world will flee from us. And there's plenty of that going out in Christendom these days. But we are to leak mercy, grace, kindness. It kills me, it kills me that it was always the religious leaders that were getting in trouble. The people that Jesus got angry with were people who graduated from seminary. I'm just like, oh, man. You know, that, that, that's my, my crowd. And so uh, the, the, the point in all of this is that there's a, how we do this matters um, in, in our lives. So how we leak uh, matters. It's all driven uh, by love. And that's what the passage began with. And you know why it's all driven by love? This is just kind of this cool thing. One of the things I've discovered, it is much easier to extend mercy, grace, 
and kindness to people I love. Amen? Amen? It's just, it, it, it's much easier to extend that to my children. It's much easier to extend that to my wife. It's much easier to extend that to, to people like you that I, that I love and I, I, I care about. And so the, the, what is going on with all of this is that's why I started with love in all of this, is this is what love looks like flowing, flowing out of us in so many different ways. So how you think about God determines how you relate to God. If you think God is mean and cruel and throws rocks and he's a judge and he's looking to get you, you know, you're going to respond to him like that. You go, oh, I don't want anything to do with that kind of thing. But if you think of him as one who's filled with kindness and grace and mercy, you will be attracted to him. Now let me say something that's going to give up preaching and go to meddling. Some of you struggle with extending mercy and grace and kindness because it was never given to you. It wasn't given to you in your home. Maybe it isn't given to you at work or the crowd you hang with or sadly even in a church. And I want to invite you this morning to take the opportunity to allow God's mercy in your life. Whatever your past is, God wants to fix that up. He wants to purify it. Let him come in. And, and whatever your future is, he wants to fill it with grace, with his working in your life. And he's already been gracious. And I encourage you to reflect on all the good things that God has poured into your life. And even if you don't think there are very many, the good ones are from God. And when you follow him, there are more good ones to come. And it should be filled with kindness in, in your life. I, I just encourage you to allow that to flow in your life. Y'all know about the L.A. River, the river in L.A.? You know, it used to be this big river, and they pulled all kinds of stuff out of it. Uh, today it looks like this. In my world, I call this a creek or a crick, depending on which part of the world I'm in. How many say creek? How many say crick? Yeah, <laughs> so we're divided. We have a divided church. Um, and this, this is what it normally is. Once big river is just re reduced to this little thing that kind of flows in, in, in there. And some of you, I, I think, when you think about grace because of the way you were raised, you, you think that in spite of all of the riches of Christ, he kind of doles it out with an eyedropper. Up, up, we'll see how you do with that little piece of grace. You know what's been raining in California? You know what this looks like now? That. Yeah, that's the way God pours grace into people. He just drowned you in the stuff, you know? In his love for you and his kindness toward you, he wants to do so much for you. And so I want to say to you, let God's mercy, grace, and kindness flow in you and through you. Let God's mercy, grace, and kindness flow in you and through you to the world around. Let it leak around the people all around you. May we be a people that are filled with sweetness that leaks out of it, that the spiritual juice of the fruit of the Spirit gets on the people around me, that we give people hope, and that we give them mercy, grace, and kindness. Amen? Amen? I uh, have no idea what time it is because the clock has gone back there. So I'm going to wrap it up. Am I over or I'm under? Yeah. What? I'm good. Okay, good. We started with this, and I want to end with this. Do life in such a way that people are attracted to the Jesus they see in you. Amen. Would you say this with me? Do life in such a way that people are attracted to the Jesus they see in you. Let me pray for you, and then we're going to sing. And again, if you have not let God's grace and mercy into your life, I encourage you in these moments to just open your heart to God. You'll be amazed at what he can do in your life. Heavenly Father, thank you for these good people. Thank you, Father, that you allow us to, to leak you in so many ways, Father. And Lord, I, I pray that we would be a church that, that's leaky, <laughs> that we just leak Jesus everywhere we go and that, that people are attracted to us and to our church, not because of the stuff of the church, but because they see you in us, Father. I pray, Lord, that you'd make us a people that are excited about what you are doing in our world and, and that we would give hope to people who seem hopeless, Father, and that everyone we come in contact with would sense and experience the love of Christ in our lives. And we will be careful, Father, to give you all of the praise and all of the glory, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey church family, thank you so much for watching this video. We hope that God is inspiring you and working in your life. If so, make sure you send this video to a friend so that they can be impacted by the good news of the gospel as well. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss a single video. And as always, we hope that God is continuing to work and move in your life. Thanks again for watching. God bless.